Well, it's been a couple of weeks now, and uh, just as I expected, Steve Anderson has not answered my challenge um, because I, he's cowardly and uh, he doesn't want to deal with a real preacher. He's used to having people who don't know the Bible sit under his ministry and, uh, and he can yell at them and scream at them and, and put on a little charismatic show and they have no idea what really the Bible teaches because they haven't studied the Word and so he can deceive them. But when he runs into a real preacher and is challenged, well, he runs away. Okay, Typical standard operating procedure for false prophets. But I asked those ten questions and now I'm going to answer them. Okay, I'm going to answer them, show you the real truth from the King James Bible and why I picked those ten questions to prove that the pre-trib rapture is the real truth. Okay? All ten of those questions debunk his theory. Now I'm going to demonstrate that in this study here. Question number one. Where is the resurrection of dead saints mentioned in Matthew chapter 24, Mark 13, Mark, excuse me, Mark 13 or Luke 17 and 21? And you see the argument there from the pre-wrath or post-trib position is they have to try and make 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 through 58. The rapture passages, they have to make them line up with the Gospels. The problem is, in the rapture passages, the dead are going up before the living. Now, you won't find that in any of the Gospel accounts. There are no de dead saints being resurrected at Christ's second coming, which is what the uh, Gospel accounts are all about there, the ones that I mentioned. In fact, you say, well, I don't know if I believe that. Okay, look up the word dead. You know, like the dead in Christ, you know, dead. Look up the word dead and show me where it appears in the King James Bible. I can't speak for the other ones. But show me where it appears in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 17, or Luke 21. Show me the word dead in any of those chapters. It's not in there. But uh, let's look at some scriptures here. Matthew chapter 24, verses 29 through 31 says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now they'll say, see, it's the rapture. It's the rapture. This is definitely the rapture. No, it isn't. Okay. Did you see any dead saints coming up there? You say, well, it's, it's, in, the, it's in there and everything. It's, it's there. They just don't say dead. Well, here's a problem with that. If you notice there in verse 30, it says, they shall see the Son of Man coming, okay, in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Um, last time I checked, dead people usually don't see things, okay? The dead saints right now, the body of Christ, they are with the Lord, absent from the body, present with the Lord, but their bodies, they're basically disembodied souls in heaven right now, their bodies are in the ground, all right? If you have a saved loved one that dies, you go to the funeral, you see their body in the casket. When a saint dies, their body doesn't disappear because their body's corruptible. It goes into the ground and it rots. All right? The incorruptible body comes at the rapture, not before and not after. If you are a member of the body of Christ and you are saved, your incorruptible body comes at the rapture. You don't go the whole way through the second coming. Why? Because it's not written. All right? The people that are seeing Jesus Christ at the second coming, they're living. You say, prove that. Okay? Matthew chapter 24, verses 37 through 42. Watch this. But as the days of Noah were, you know, the, the New Testament form of Noah there, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark. And knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now look at this, verse 40. Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken and the other left. 
Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. Um, did you see any dead saints coming up? No. Okay. They're living people. There are no dead saints resurrected in Matthew 24. You say, well, how about Mark 13? Let's go there. Mark 13, verses 24 through 27. But in those days after that tribulation, tribulation, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars of heaven shall fall and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then shall he send his angels and shall gather together his elect from the four winds from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. Okay, again, they see Jesus coming. There's no dead saints mentioned there. How about Luke 17, verses 26 through 29? And as it was in the days of Noah, or Noe, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noe entered into the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise also it was in the days of Lot. They did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded, but the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Verse 30. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. Remember Lot's wife. Hmm. Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. I tell you, in that night there shall be two men in one bed, the one shall be taken and the other shall be left. Two women shall be grinding together, the one shall be taken and the other left. Two men shall be in the field, the one shall be taken and the other left. And they answered and said unto him, now look at this, Where, Lord? In other words, where are they taken? And he said unto them, Wheresoever the body is, thither will the eagles be gathered together. Now, if you know your Bible, you realize that that's the battle of Armageddon, Revelation chapter 19. So these people that are taken are taken there. They're taken out of the way. They see the Antichrist rise to power. They flee Jerusalem. And they're out there in the mountains, and the Antichrist and his armies come out to wipe out that final remnant of the Jewish people. And that's when Jesus Christ and us, his saints, come down and do battle. It's really not much of a battle because it's just Jesus Christ against 200 million man army. And Jesus just opens his mouth and his sword of the Spirit comes out and just, whoosh, just wipes them out. Then we get to ride through their blood. Uh, it's what the Bible teaches, you know, whatever. And the, the eagles come and gather themselves together and they come down to eat all the, those dead bodies. That's what the Bible teaches. But again, notice a couple things here. Verse 32 pictures a woman who lost her salvation. Remember Lot's wife. She turned around and looked back to the city. Now, when the Antichrist shows up and sets himself up in the temple, they're supposed to flee Jerusalem. They're supposed to run away and get out of there. And if they turn around and go back, they lose their salvation. Okay? Salvation in the time of Jacob's trouble is going to be faith and works. A lot of people get upset with me about that, but it's there. If you take the mark of the beast, I don't care how sanctified and holy and saved, quote unquote, you think you are, you lose your salvation. Just a plain teaching of Scripture. Now, verses 34 through 36, again, you have the two in one bed, one taken, one left, uh, two women grinding together, one taken, one left, two men in the field, one taken, one left. Where are the dead? Where are the dead being resurrected? It's not there. It's just simply not there. Okay? Uh, Luke chapter 21, verse 27 through 36 says, And then shall they see the sign of... Then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Again, they see. You know, dead people aren't going to see. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. And he spake to them a parable. Behold, the fig tree and all the trees, when they now shoot forth, ye see and know of your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. So likewise ye, when ye see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. 
Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life, and so that day come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore, and pray always, that ye be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass, and to stand before the Son of Man. Again, where are the dead saints? They're not there. There is no dead in Christ, especially because all these gospel accounts were given before Jesus died on the cross. So nobody that he was talking to was in Christ. And you say, oh, but they were saved back there by looking forward to the cross. Really? Why is it then whenever Jesus would say to them, he would tell about the death that he was going to die, but dying on the cross for sins? Why is it that they were always going, huh? You know, Peter rebuked him, said, far be it from thee, Lord. You know, no. If they're getting saved by looking forward to the cross, they wouldn't have been saying, what are you talking about? And they wouldn't have, Peter wouldn't have rebuked Jesus Christ. Don't fall for that lie that they were saved by looking forward to the cross. That's nonsense. Okay, there is not any scripture to back that thing up. That's a lie. Question number two that I asked to Steve Anderson. Did Jesus and Paul preach the same gospel? Now, if you're non-dispensational, you have to say yes to that. You have to say, well, yes, they, of course they preached the same gospel. They didn't preach two different gospels. Uh, answer. Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom because the prophesied Jewish king was on the earth. And Jesus preached two kingdoms, by the way. This is something else that a lot of the non-dispensational people don't understand. The kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. Okay? Now, the kingdom of heaven that Jesus Christ pre preached only appears in the book of Matthew. You will not find the term kingdom of heaven, those three words in succession, you will not find that term anywhere else in the entire King James Bible. The book of Matthew only. Kingdom of heaven. Okay? And you say, what's it, re what's it referring to? It is a reference to the physical, literal, visible kingdom on earth. You say, prove it. I was hoping you'd ask. <laughs> Matthew chapter 5, verse 35, nor, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Is Jerusalem where Jesus Christ is at right now? No, far from it. But it will be one day. Jesus Christ is going to rule and reign from Jerusalem in the millennial kingdom. We're going to talk more about that in a little bit. But Matthew chapter 11, verse 12 is the real scripture here you need to get on the kingdom of heaven. It says here, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. A lot of commentators you're going to see will say that the kingdom of heaven is a reference to where God is. Oh, really? Uh, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force? Huh? Nobody's going to take heaven by force. Okay? Uh, nobody's going to be able to whip God. Uh, I don't think so. What it's talking about there is that earthly kingdom that's promised to the Jewish people with the headquarters being in Jerusalem, the city of the great king. That was the kingdom, one of the kingdoms that Jesus Christ was preaching. He was preaching the kingdom of God, or the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. Two different kingdoms. Okay? But let me just say this. There are times when the kingdom of God can refer to to that physical kingdom here on the earth. Usually it's spiritual, which I'm going to show you here in just a couple minutes, but there are times when it can refer to the physical, literal, visible kingdom on earth headquartered at Jerusalem. Let me show you. Luke chapter 13, verse 28 through 29 says, There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when ye shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrust out. And they shall come from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. Okay? Reference to the millennial kingdom. But usually it's a reference to spiritual fellowship, spiritual union between, between God and man. Okay? Let me show you that. Romans chapter 14, verse 17 says, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, in other words, physical, it's not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Spiritual fellowship, righteousness, peace, 
joy in the Holy Ghost. It's spiritual, not physical. Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21, very familiar portion of Scripture. It says here, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay? Reference to that spiritual fellowship between God and man. You mess around with sin, God's not going to be able to fellowship with you. doesn't mean you lose your salvation. A lot of people say that, oh, you don't go to the kingdom of God, that means heaven. No, it doesn't mean that. Okay, there's a lot of uh, Bible-believing out there that are, get messed up in heresy. There's a lot that have wrath. There's a lot that practice emulation and strife. Okay? And I go through the other ones, too, there. You know, but uh, it's a reference to that spiritual fellowship between God and man. And, you know, in a some certain way, too, it can be a reference to the millennial kingdom. You mess around with sin all your life. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If you're not suffering for Jesus Christ, you're not going to reign. Simple as that. But let me make this point very clear. Paul never preached a physical kingdom on the earth. He never told Christians, let's go out and spread a kingdom. Okay? He never said, let's take Jerusalem and make it the city of the great king. Paul never preached a physical kingdom on the earth. You have to understand that. Okay? And Paul plainly states that the gospel that we have today, the gospel for the body of Christ, the church age, if you will, that gospel was revealed to Paul. You say, prove it. Okay. Romans chapter 2, verse 16. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Romans chapter 16, verse 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 11. According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which was committed to my trust. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. All right? And what is Paul's gospel? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that, I, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. All right? Death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. That's our gospel today. Now, be very careful, because the hyper-dispensationalists will come in and they'll say, anybody before Paul was not really saved. They're in a different body. No, there's only one body, one body of Christ, okay? The Christians that were saved back there in the first century are part of that body, and if you're saved today, you're part of that one body. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, you can look that up. There are not multiple bodies, all right? Don't fall for that. And the hyper-dispensationalist will say, well, there's the church of the one body, which is Paul till the rapture, and then there's another church, which was the other disciples up until Paul. No, 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 no. Because Romans chapter 16 talks about, he named, Paul talks about a couple believers and he says, who were in Christ before me, you know. So, no, all members of the body of Christ are in the one body, okay. But there was a transition period there. Again, the book of Acts is a transition book. So you have to be careful. You have to rightly divide it or else you can get messed up in doctrine. It's a transitional book and when Paul shows up, the 12th apostle, he shows up, and now the gospel is revealed to him. Our gospel is revealed to, to you know, our gospel of today is revealed to Paul, right? Because he's the one that mostly is going to the Gentiles. There are others before him. Peter goes to the Gentiles too. I know that a lot of this stuff is a big study, which we can't uh, get into. But uh, one other point I want to make there 
the gospel in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, Jesus never preached that. You say, oh, I believe that we all, you know, the, the whole Bible, there's just one gospel. You're quite foolish. <laughs> okay? Jesus never preached the death, burial, and resurrection of himself before it happened. He said it was going to happen, but that wasn't the gospel. All right? That didn't happen until after he died on the cross. So Jesus and Paul preached two different gospels. That's a problem if you're a pre-wrath, post-trib believer. Okay? Because you have to erase that distinction between the gospel accounts where a different gospel, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, you know, there's three there. I'll talk about John in a future video. But you have to get rid of that distinction there that that was preached to Jews. You say, oh no, no that was preached to Christians. They weren't preaching the same gospel. Again, that's why Steve Anderson can't answer this. Question number three. Can you provide documented proof of Bible-believing Christians teaching a pre-wrath rapture before 1830? Now, that's the big claim. There's no mention of a pre-trib rapture before 1830. And I showed, I think it's post-trib moment number nine, that yes, there is quite a few people that have talked about a pre-tribulation -ra pre rapture of the body of Christ back a couple centuries after the Bible is finished, you know, completed. I think second and third century quotations. You know, so the whole thing's a lie. Okay? And it's also, are we really supposed to be basing our truth on what church tradition has been? The church fathers, most of which were very heretical in their beliefs, you know, baptismal regeneration and all kinds of other stuff. I mean, some weird stuff that the church fathers believed in, but we're supposed to base our truth on that? Um, sounds kind of Catholic to me. You know, if you have sacred scripture saying one thing and divine tradition another, you go with divine, divine tradition. The writings of the church fathers and things. That's Catholic. That's not the stands of a Bible believer. Hey, I don't care if something was invented 10 years ago, a year ago. doesn't matter to me. It does line up with the book. Is it according to the scriptures. This is the standard here, not what Christians in the past believed, taught. And let me just say this. Most real Christians in the past, in the early centuries of church history, they were being persecuted. Their writings were burned. They were burned. They were tortured by the Catholic Church. So you're not going to have storehouses of books that are almost 2,000 years old talking about when the rapture is going to happen. You know, whatever. But he makes it sound, you know, Steve Anderson implies that there's just mountains of information, just books and things and all kinds of tracts and writings and sermons and all this stuff and not one mention of the pre-trib rapture. Thereby leaving the reader or the, the viewer to, to believe that then it all must have been pre-wrath or post-trib, you know. That is what they're left to believe, of course. He doesn't give you any documentation. He doesn't really give you any names. But I had one of his followers say that John Gill was one who wrote about a pre-wrath rapture. Interesting, though, because John Gill was a hyper-Calvinist. So these guys, you know, they'd never agree with a hyper-Calvinist, but yet they'll use a hyper-Calvinist to prove that there was some proof for a pre-wrath rapture before 1830. <laughs> Pretty bad argument. And, and, you know, if you hear people talk about uh, church fathers or people that talked about a post-trib rapture, um, and Steve Anderson says, see, post-trib rapture. Steve Anderson's not post-trib. He's pre-wrath. That's a very important distinction. He doesn't teach that it's the whole way after the tribulation. He tries to say the tribulation is the first three and a half years, and then after that is the wrath. That's nonsense. That's Marvin Rosenthal. Okay, 1980s is when this stuff mostly came out. You know, and Steve Anderson, you know, pretty much parrots Marvin Rosenthal. I think I have his book here behind me somewhere. I'm not going to bother looking for it. But Marvin Rosenthal was against the Jews, you know, as far as the nation of Israel and things. He taught replacement theology. The same things that Steve Anderson is teaching. Okay? Whatever. Question number four. Please explain the prophecy Jesus gave concerning the rebirth of the fig tree in Matthew 24, verses 32 through 34. 
Now the answer to that is that the nation of Israel is who Jesus prophesied would be reborn. It's a big problem if you believe in replacement theology. If you believe that the Jews are no more, which is exactly what Steve Anderson teaches, then you couldn't believe in that prophecy. But let's look at the scripture here. Matthew chapter 24, verses 32 through 34. Now learn a parable of the fig tree, when its branch is yet tender, and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Now according to the Bible, King James Bible, who is the fig tree? Jeremiah chapter 24 verse 5 says, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, Look like these good figs, so will I acknowledge them that are carried away captive of Judah, whom I have sent out of this place into the land of the Chaldeans for their good. The Jews are the ones that are likened to figs, and Israel is the fig tree. So that is who Jesus Christ is giving a prophecy about. He says at the beginning of Matthew chapter 24, they come and they say, Look at this temple, isn't this wonderful? And Jesus says, You see those stones there? There won't be one on top of another. You know, till all is thrown down. And, and then they come and they're like, what are the signs of thy coming and of the end of the world? And, you know, and he gets into it. And then he comes and he says, okay, first he prophesies that Israel is going to be destroyed, wiped out. The temple will be destroyed. Then he comes back and says Israel is going to be reborn as a nation at some point in time. Okay, very significant prophecy there. And, of course, if you know your history and your Bible prophecy, Israel was reborn as a nation in 1948. So that generation that sees that won't pass away to all be fulfilled. Bible prophecy, the fulfillment of Scripture. But why would Steve Anderson need to cover this up? Why wouldn't he talk about that? Well, Jeremiah chapter 30 verse 7 says, Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Jacob is another word for Israel. This time period that is coming is for the purification of the Jewish people. It's for Israel. It's not for Baptists in Arizona or something. It's not who it's for that think that they're Jewish, you know. I, I mean, look at that. Watch, watch the crazy nut, you know, this little Stephen Anderson. Watch him, you know, messing around with the Border Patrol. He's got this little thing that he likes to go with the Border Patrol and get, you know, harass him and whatever and stuff and and talk about his constitutional rights and all this. And he goes there and he says, I'm a citizen of Israel. And they're like, well, do you have papers and stuff? Oh, no, I can prove it from the Bible. I'm a citizen of Israel. <laughs> what a nut. Matthew chapter 24, verse 15 and 16. I'll show you a few others that, that uh, Stephen Anderson does not like to cover. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Steve Anderson reads it and doesn't understand. Verse 16, Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Why didn't he cover that in his uh, post-trib moments videos? Why didn't he cover the fact that Matthew chapter 24, he says, oh, they try to say it's for the Jews. Uh, hey, who's in Judea? Hmm? How about the, the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place? What's the holy place? Well, for a Christian, know you not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. Here's the holy place for a Christian. But for a Jew, it's a temple, physical temple. Can't cover that stuff. That makes you look bad. Mark chapter 13, verse 9. Let's read that. But take heed to yourselves, for they shall deliver you up to councils, and in the synagogues ye shall be beaten, and ye shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them. What are Christians doing in synagogues? Could it be that the time of Jacob's trouble is for Jews, and that the Jews will be beaten in their own synagogues? Yeah. Luke chapter 21, verse 20 through 21 says, And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter therein too. 
Okay? Now, Steve Anderson can't cover these types of verses. He can't talk about these. He can't dwell on these. Why? Because it clearly shows that the time is for the Jewish people, the people of Israel. All right? And he tries to say now that the people in Israel aren't really Jews. Well, then the Bible would be a lie. I mean, the Bible prophesied, Matthew 24, that the nation of Israel would be reborn, the fig tree. And yet, oh, it, it was, this nation was reborn, but they're not actually the Jews. The Jews are actually white people living in America. <laughs> yeah, okay. Question number five. What is the fullness of the Gentiles, and when will it come in? Again, a real problem if you're, if you're into replacement theology. A real problem. Answer, Romans chapter 11, verses 25 through 33. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in and so all Israel shall be saved as, is, as it is written. There shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. And this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. It's talking about the Jews here. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. For as ye in times past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief. Notice what's going on here. Ye, who's Paul writing to? Romans. He's writing to Gentiles. And he's saying, ye in times past have not believed God. Our Gentile ancestors didn't believe God, yet now have obtained mercy through their unbelief, the Jews. If the Jewish nation would have accepted Jesus Christ as their Messiah, we wouldn't be here. Okay, all the events would have happened probably back there in the first century and Jesus would have ruled on the earth and things would be a lot different. Okay, but through their fall, the Jews, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Continuing here, verse 31, Even so have these also now not believed that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. O oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Amen to that. We serve an amazing God. But uh, <clears throat> let's read here Jeremiah chapter 46, verses 27 and 28. I want to show you when the fullness of the Gentiles is going to be come in. It says here, But fear not thou, O my servant Jacob, and be not dismayed, O Israel. Could it be any clearer who this is written to? For behold, I will save thee from afar off, and thy seed from the land of their captivity, and Jacob shall return and be in rest and at ease, and none shall make him afraid. Has that happened yet? No. The Jewish people have been persecuted more than any other people out there down through the centuries. Why? Because the Bible said that that was going to happen. But they have not... They have returned to their land, but they're not at ease there. It's the, they're on the brink of war all the time. You know, They're on the brink of war right now. They could go to war with Iran tomorrow. I mean, it's crazy. Verse 28, Jeremiah 46, 28 says, Fear thou not, O Jacob, my servant, saith the Lord, for I am with thee, for I will make a full end of all the nations whither I have driven thee, but I will not make a full end of thee, but correct thee in measure, yet will I not leave thee wholly unpunished. Oh, well, I can't believe in the nation of Israel right now because they're in sin. Yeah, that's why God's going to punish them. That's the purpose of the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay? And God is actually going to destroy all the nations except for one. It's, you can talk about a new world order. Talk about a one-world government. Jesus Christ is going to set one up for the Millennial Kingdom. It comes after the Antichrist New World Order, but he's going to set up the real one, and all the nations are going to be destroyed, all the Gentile nations, every single one of them. There isn't going to be any more, God bless America, gone, sorry. You know, all the nations are going to be destroyed, except for one, the Jewish people. 
You say, what is that? The fullness of the Gentiles become in. Right now, Israel is this little dinky little nation and everybody's going, you know, at it and you have all these people hating the Jews and everything else. And the fullness of the Gentiles has not come in fully yet. But when the Gentiles come in, they're at the time of Jacob's trouble and God says, okay, boom, and he wipes out America and boom, he wipes out the UK and boom, he wipes out Germany and boom, he wipes out France and Russia, you know, China, boom. Africa, boom, you know, he wipes them all out. But not the Jews. That's the fullness of the Gentiles. And if you say, well, I, I don't believe that the nation of Israel, I think that that's no more and, you know, we're not going to see anything, then you're calling God a liar. That's what Steve Anderson does. Okay? Again, he can't answer these questions. <clears throat> Question number six. Who are the elect mentioned in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 10? Now, if you watch Steve Anderson's videos, he will say time and time and time again that the elect, every reference to the elect in the Bible, that all of the references are to believers. He can't handle Scripture. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Okay, the seed of David there. Wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sakes, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. You see, Stephen Anderson Always claimed, he claims that the elect are always a reference to believers because, you see, he needs to tie that in to Matthew chapter 24, verses 22, 24, and 31, where it talks about the elect. He has to tie that in to Christians being called the elect in, Pauline, in the Pauline epistles. So he has to say the elect are always Christians, and because you see elect in the Pauline epistles and you see the elect in Matthew 24, that's the same group, and we go up in all this... He doesn't know what he's talking about. Okay? The elect there in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 10, it's a reference to lost Jews. You can't duck that thing. Again, Steve Anderson's a liar. Just as simple as that. Question number seven. Could you please give one reference in the Bible where the words the tribulation or the great tribulation are used as a title for this coming time period? Now, the answer to that is there are a lot of references here. I'm going to just read through them real quick. I'm not going to read the whole verse because it's going to take too long. But it says, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 30, when thou art in tribulation. Okay, it's always going to see, every time you see the word tribulation, it's always a description of what's going on. It's never a title. Let's continue. Judges 10, verse 14. Then let them... Let them deliver you in the time of your tribulation. 1 Samuel chapter 26, verse 24. And let him deliver me out of all tribulation. Matthew 13, verse 21. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. Matthew 24, verse 21. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. People say, see, there's the great tribulation. Uh, I didn't see the word the. It's a description. There shall be great tribulation. Not there shall be the great tribulation. Now I know it's a very popular thing, so you'll see me using the word in the tribulation or the tribulation or pre-tribulation rapture. Understand that. Okay? But I'll show you in a minute here why they use this thing. Mark chapter 13 verse 24 but in those days after that tribulation the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light again description John chapter 16 verse 33 in the world ye shall have tribulation Acts 14 verse 22 must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God Romans 2 9 tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil Romans chapter 5, verse 3, And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Not a title, 
a description. Romans 8, verse 35, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution? Romans 12, verse 12, Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4, Who comforteth us in all our tribulation. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 4, I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. 1 Thessalonians 3, 4, uh, We told you before that we should suffer tribulation. And speaking of the things that a Christian will go through. Okay, it's not talking about this coming time of Jacob's trouble. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6, Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. Revelation 1, 9, uh, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. Okay, he's not talking about the time of Jacob's trouble, often called the time of tribulation or the, the tribulation time. Revelation 2, 9, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty. Revelation 2, 10, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Okay, not speaking of this coming seven-year time period. Revelation 2, verse 22. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and, then, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. Description once more. Finally, Revelation chapter 7, verse 14. And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, these are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So, all the references to tribulation, I just read them all. Every single one of them, it's always a description. It's always something that you're going through. Always a, a, a hardship, a trial, whatever. A tribulation. It's never a title given for this coming time period. And... Steve Anderson and people like him, they like to play little word games with this the tribulation thing. You see, because if he says the tribulation, he can show viewers verses that say that Christians go through tribulation. He says, see? And see, the ignorant viewer, the one who's ignorant of Scripture, they go, oh boy, it says right there that we go through tribulation. So we're going through the tribulation. No, 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 no. Again, that's why I asked the question. That's why you can't answer it. Question number eight. More here and then we're done. If all Christians gave up looking for the rapture, could we stop the New World Order? You know, he goes on Alex Jones' program, Alex Jones, the New Ager, and, you know, Alex Jones, we can defeat the New World Order, you know, and all this stuff. And people want to believe that after a while. And they start thinking, well, maybe we can defeat the New World Order. Maybe we don't have to go into this thing. Maybe the Bible's not true. That's really the issue. But the fact is, no. You know, Steve Anderson wants his viewers to believe that there's this great urgency. You know, we have to stop this pre-trib rapture thing. You know, we have to do it so Christians aren't going to be deceived. Yet he teaches that Christians can't take the mark of the beast. He teaches that the mark of the beast, you know, when it's being given, there's going to be the Antichrist will have brain scanners. And he'll be able to tell who's really saved and who's not. <laughs> okay. Chapter and verse on that, of course not. But the, the main problem is here, Steve, Anser, Steve Anderson you know, and people like that, they like to show their patriotism and their political activism and things, and they smart-mouth Border Patrol agents, they'll go and they'll smart-mouth cops or military or whatever else. And, you know, I understand that there's corruption in the government. I understand that. I understand that the New World Order thing's bad. I'm not saying that that stuff isn't true and, and bad and it's unconstitutional and whatever else. But it's prophesied. Okay? I'm real sorry, you know, that you want to get out of it. You know, I mean, hey, here's a thought for those people out there that say, Oh, you see, see, these pre-tribbers like this guy here. You're trying to get out of the, you know, you're, you're, you're not fighting the New World Order, fighting the forces of the New World Order. Oh, actually, yeah, I am. You see, because I'm preaching to people. I'm telling them to turn from sin. You know? Hey, if we want to defeat the New World Order, you know how you do it? Turn from sin. It's called repentance. If America as a nation would repent and turn to God and say, we're sinners, 
we're sorry, God heal our land, and they drive out all the filth and garbage from Hollywood, all the pornography, all the sodomy, all the other wicked things that are going on, all this modern church stuff, if they would do that, then we could turn it around. But fighting for the Constitution and writing your congressman letters and things like that, that's not going to stop the New World Order. I mean, come on. People have been doing that for years now. What's it done? Nothing. You know? Whatever. Question number nine. What city will Jesus rule and reign from during the millennium? It's a good question. You know, if you're into replacement theology, maybe you'd be tempted to say somewhere in uh, America. Maybe, you know, maybe Jesus will rule and reign from Arizona, you know, where Steve Anderson is. You know, maybe he'll come there and he'll build a, a kingdom there that fights the Antichrist, you know, and all this other stuff. And, you know, you never know with these guys. You never know what they're going to come up with. Uh, there's a, a preacher, a, a, I hate to call him even that, James Manning, I did a sermon on him, and he's teaching that, that the Millennial Kingdom is going to be ruled from Harlem. You know, <laughs> yeah, okay. But uh, let's, let me show you here some scriptures here on the thing of Jerusalem being the city of the great king. You know, where the Jews are, you know, the kingdom of heaven centered at Jerusalem, the city of the great king. Zechariah chapter 14, verses 16 through 20. And it shall come to pass that every one that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. By the way, if you're not premillennial, how do you explain that? They go up to worship the King in Jerusalem. And it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families, families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. And if the family of Egypt go not up and come not, that have no rain, there shall be the plague, wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the feast of tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the feast of tabernacles. In that day shall there be upon the bells of the horses holiness unto the Lord, and the pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Verse 21, Yea, every pot in Jerusalem and in, and in Judah shall be holiness unto the Lord of hosts, and all they that sacrifice shall come and take of them and see therein. In that day there shall be no more the Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. Okay, Steve Anderson's uh, hatred for the Jewish people is so totally unfounded, you know, upon Scripture, it's just a joke to even believe that way, this whole replacement theology lie. It is so wicked. I mean, that right there disqualifies the guy from ministry. But I'm going to talk about that more in another video. Finally, the tenth question that I asked, who brings in the New World Order, God or Satan? You see, a lot of these patriot-type guys and, and, you know, the Alex Jones and people like that there, you know, it's the devil that brings in the New World Order and the Illuminati and all these other satanic people and things like that. Uh, no, actually, those guys are just being used. All right? They're not really all-powerful. God, you know, I mean, take some of these guys, like you see David Rockefeller. He's this scrawny little old man now and, and things, about ready to die and go to hell. You know, shame. It's a shame he couldn't get saved. But, uh, you know, these guys aren't super powerful. And, you know, the Bible talks about Jesus Christ, you know, by Him all things consist. You know, if the Lord wanted to drop any member of the Illuminati, He wouldn't even have to snap His fingers. He could just think a thought and bam, they're dead. You know, they're not all powerful. You know, in the realm of men, yeah, a lot of those guys are above the law, but in, in the spiritual realm, God's not worried about any of those guys. But what does the Bible actually say? about who brings in this one world government that's coming. Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 8 says, Therefore wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey, for my determination is to gather the nations that I may assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger, for all the earth shall be devour, devoured with the fire of my jealousy. Hmm. Interesting there. 
my determination is to gather the nations, that I may assemble the kingdoms? Then the answer to the question would be, God is the one who's building the new world order. This one world government that's coming. And, uh, you know, who opens the first seal there in Revelation chapter 6, verses 1 through 2? You know, the Lord Jesus does. Why? Because the Jewish people have to be corrected. The Jewish people, the Orthodox Jews, do not believe in the New Testament. They don't believe this book from cover to cover. They have their Bible, which is very similar to the Old Testament of our King James Bible, but they don't believe the New Testament yet. But they're going to. You know why? Because the Jews require a sign. And they're going to get seven years of signs and wonders to confirm the New Testament, the accuracy of the New Testament. And the fullness of the Gentiles will be come in. God's going to say, I'm going to make an end of the, the Gentile nations, all nations except for Jerusalem. All right? And then he's going to bring in his real, true kingdom. So when these people are saying, you know, we have to do something to stop the pre trib rapture belief system and we, we have to do this and, and whatever, they don't know Scripture. That time period that's coming is for the Jewish people, not for the church. Okay? And you cannot replace those Jewish people with the church, with the body of Christ. It can't be done. I mean, you look at it over and over and over and over again. The Bible is plainly teaching that that time period that's coming is for the purification of the Jewish people, which means the church has to be gone before it comes. And I've covered that in many of my other studies. You know, it's proven. I'm real sorry if you're into this, this teaching of the pre-wrath rapture or even a post-trib rapture. They're both wrong. So what is Steve Anderson? Well, I'm going to talk about that in the next video. This one went long enough, so I'm going to quit for now. Uh, thank you for watching this. And Steve Anderson, if you watched this thing and you made it the whole way through, you better repent. You better shut your mouth about the pre-trib rapture. All right? Because you've been proven now to be a false prophet. I challenged you. You would not debate this issue. You would not answer my questions. All right? You're a coward. Just as simple as that. So thank you for watching.